All right. Uh, hey, everyone. Uh, how's it going? Uh, me and Brian are back uh, for another Half Dead Musings podcast. Um, what are we up to now, Brian? Eight. Number eight. Eight. Not bad. Uh, we're uh, racking some up here. Maybe so, we should um, do a live stream for the 10th. Yeah, that would be kind of cool. Something different. Bust out. Yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. Real quick. Uh, I wanted to say I've, I've got an NFT called uh, Titan and they have just promoted this podcast and everything. I'm grateful for uh, the whole crew over there and I'm sure they're going to watch and, you know, uh, that'd be awesome if uh, all that crew jumps in and it. anyways, I'm going to have the link in the description as well. So, all right, go ahead. All right. Well, I hope they enjoy and uh, get something out of this. So uh, I got, uh, I'll try to make it entertaining for you. Uh, basically, uh, I'm a little excited about this one. Um, I don't have all the, uh, I'm going to have some slides for you guys. Um, I don't have all the ones I want right now, but you know, life time crunch type of situation. So I have a couple things. Uh, I've been basically doing a deep dive into politi uh, geopolitics recently. And this stuff is really fascinating. Uh, it really gripped me. It feels like it's kind of like a cheat code to what's going on in the world and, and what the future holds to a certain extent, because there's certain kind of immutable facts that you can't get around. Like there's mm -hmm. we, we, things Trends. change, but Trends. you kind of can get locked in by these like fundamental. It's like physics, you know, it's like uh, I was going to say E equals MC squared. Momentum, like that. I guess. I think that's pretty well proven at this point. Yeah, oh, like it is. Conservation of mass or like uh, of energy. conservation of energy. And it's uh, that and since some of that stuff is like demographics. So there's some really interesting parts to this whole thing. It's going to basically, it focuses on um, different countries, um, uh, not too much about their their history because I'm not a huge history buff. It's more about kind of uh, what led up to um, kind of the world order. What about money? Stand now. It has to do with energy. It has to do with agriculture. It has to do with demographics. Currency. It has to do a bit with uh, their uh, different currencies and their monetary policies of different countries. Uh, it has to do with the geography of uh, different countries and it's kind of surprising how much, I mean, it shouldn't be, but your, your land where you, you're stuck with determines a lot about what happens uh, to you as a country and, you know, what, yeah, what the future holds time. for you. Like Germany. Basically. It's like, it's like being a Delta hand of poker. Like the hand you got, it's you can't you can't change it. You a can quick only side play tangent. the hand you're dealt. I was gonna so say, you could just okay, sure, why not? Germany, yeah. Like if you look at World War One, the the best army in the entire world at that time was Germany, and they're surrounded by enemies on both sides, and their water access is uh, basically blocked by the greatest naval power, which was the English, the British. And so Germany, like even in World War II, like they're screwed geographically. Like even though as great and as brilliant and as high of a population they had, I'm not. I'm not just saying this because I'm German, but uh, like they. We were got an so Ubermensch over here, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> but I'm mostly Polish, so I'm more of a victim to the Germans, even though I got a German last name. So I'm half victim, okay. half. Uh, There's uh, the part of you that can't screw in a light bulb. <laughs> all right, go go ahead. Uh, I didn't mean to interrupt too much. Go ahead. Uh, no, no worries. Um, so, um, yeah, so it's kind of new me. I've just been deep diving into this and I find it really fascinating and I, I'm kind of, it's, uh, opening up a lot of insights for me. So I'm going to share it, uh, you know, kind of the best I can. This is the first kind of rough draft of kind of presenting this kind of information. I'm kind of probably refine it a little bit and uh, it's not uh, not really scripted. I didn't really rehearse this at all. I've got some notes and I've got a couple of slides that I got uh, to help out. Um, cool, I look forward so to this. So kind of when you have a good PowerPoint presentations, kind of the slides kind of help you tell the story. Exactly. You, you get a beginning and it has a logical flow and you can kind of carry that out. I don't have that because I don't have those all in a row. So mine's probably going to be all over the we've place. Been, we've been and winging it for the my, most part. I my notes a little bit and I'll refer to some of this other Good. stuff. Like but, I got a uh, bunch of notes too on my 
notebook paper yeah. like I always do. And but then... I think you'll find this really interesting too, Brian. I love it. I, I it, it really it ties it. into everything. It's really interesting stuff. Mm -hmm. um, so why don't I, um, I'll start with uh, a screen share and um, see if I can get this going. I think I only have like three slides because, uh, you know, it's getting late over here. But um, yeah, it's already after midnight in my now, time when right? we're starting. <laughs> yeah. So, okay. It's looking pretty good here. I just um, got to. I guess get... I'll start with uh, just demography stuff. Um, so, yeah. So, <laughs> speaking of the hand you're dealt, if you're a country, um, the age of the people who, uh, who live within your borders is, is the hand you're dealt. You, you can't do a lot to change that. Um, okay. Um, so, so the biggest generation so, is millennials. So the, um, at this point, um, it's not the biggest it's in, the, um, the, it's in the total kind of age range. When you add them up, the, the millennials have a little, the millennials are younger now and they're a little, um, uh, it's a little skinnier overall. See mm. the, the millennials is, uh, boomers have more total, um, population. I see. Um, but, uh, millennials is the second biggest trend. Um, so, so after world war two, basically this happened all over the world. Everyone came back from the war and, uh, they banging. all uh, were pretty happy and they, they wanted were, to, they to were have banging. some babies. <laughs> they were banging. So they got the fucking. So uh, as a result, we had a lot of children come around. Uh, and those are known as the baby boomers. A lot of boom, boom. Um, so <laughs> They rip on boomers these days. All these young generation, like, okay, boomer. That's like the famous mo uh, meme on the internet right now. And I can understand it because the boomers, they hold all the power in our society. Um, you could say maybe they haven't been the best stewards. Uh, they've been... Uh, the biggest voting block uh for for a while now and yeah. um so whatever world we got it's the boomers fault they ran <laughs> the world so if you're not happy with things blame the boomers and you know it's kind of easy to say okay boomer when you have a boomer who's like trying to do a computer like, video thing. chat you on your phone and then like, watch uh, this you know, how do you do this <laughs> yeah what's like, going on zooming in on their face you know it's kind of the classic yeah. thing and you're like, hold it away from your face. Oh yeah, now I can see you. Good. <laughs> uh, so, so the boomers uh, have the most uh, people in their generation, and um, the silent generation was the generation before them. So Gen X are the children of the baby boomers. Gen X is the smallest generation. Um, they are. Um, they're kind of like the forever intern generation where like they never got to the top levels they are kind of yeah. um, they're outnumbered by the boomers. Um, boomers were more um, willing to um, have both partners work in marriages. So as a result, they have a very high divorce rate. Um, Gen hmm. Xers value their time a little more. Um, so they tend to have more one person uh, working households and uh, lower divorce rates. But Boomers, they also raised, uh, they lowered wages because they flooded the workplace and there was less competition. Um, so uh, employers got away with paying lower wages because boomers and their wives, they all wanted to work to make more money. And Speaking, uh, that's I'm looking how that went. At, at the millennial part right here, we're technically millennials, but like, doesn't it feel yes. like we're not millennials in a way? Because we were able well, the to feeling is subjective. So well, the, yeah, no, but, the, the thing is though, yeah. like what defines these we're technically millennials. Yeah. It's an yeah. age range. It's, um, I, um, so yeah, it goes here, uh, anywhere from, uh, well, I was born in 1986. Same. Yeah. Uh, we're both born in 86. Two months earlier than you. Yeah. So yeah, we're like the, uh, one of the oldest cohorts of the millennials so, group. What I was going to say though, it is yeah. the reason why it feels like we're not is because if you look at the generation defining events, the internet age happened where like at the late 
uh, I guess we were in late grade school when the internet age took over and we were like chatting with friends and stuff, but we, it was new to us. Yeah. When yeah, it we came experienced out, we were life kids. first, we experienced yeah. life before the internet and, and after it's like, that should be a bit major dividing line considering the world that we are living in today, but they, that's a major experience us. difference of ours. Yeah. I mean, yeah. it's uh, it's just a clinical, um, year cut off, you know, if you try to factor in like all these different things, uh, you know, you'd have to kind of agree, like, what are we going to do? Yeah. It's a big thing, but it's just, they just do it in, in age and year ranges. So it's just a flat, mm -hmm. you know, 40 years or, you know, whatever it is. So yes, yeah, so we grew up, uh, the internet came out while we were alive. We kind of adapted to it and um, do okay with it. Um, you know, we learned to type in school and, you know, we're pretty fast typers and we played a lot of online yeah. gaming. So we had to type a lot for that. Remember, we used to have to try to hide the internet sound with the dial up. We, we would take pillows and like hide it because we were playing like video yes, games. Yes, because we're addicted to online video games like EverQuest. <laughs> Every, so 4 a.m. Like, like 4 addicts, we'd wake up, wait till everyone went to sleep, wake up to play wait. more of this video game. And wait for them and to yeah, go to and work. And the loud after. dial up noises would... Uh, <laughs> you know, they're, they're, I didn't, you could turn them off, but I wasn't that good with the computer settings. Oh, we could have that. actually turned it off. Yeah. Never heard, I never knew that. <laughs> I still don't know how to, because <laughs> by the time that came up, we had switched to broadband. So it's not yep. really an issue anymore. <laughs> it was good uh, times though. But I remember we'd be playing a, in a raid and like, uh, I don't want to, for you non-gamers, I'm not going to, you know, go into the too many details, but we were playing a raid where it's a coordinated thing where we have like... Uh, we're camping a super rare spawn. <laughs> like 50... We have to wait in line with yeah, other like, people. or like, I'm here, been here for 48 hours straight. <laughs> 50 people too. Like we do these raids and these 50, 50 people would be on working together and then we'd be... Uh, you know, oh, yeah. it's like you we'll joined be... the army when you joined the raid. So like, <laughs> here's your instructions. Wait for your time. <laughs> and then we we do that all I night until like four a.m. Raids if, until four a.m. And then we we knew your parents were gonna wake up. And then so we would uh, act like we were asleep as soon as they went to work. All right, back to it. <laughs> it was a uh, good times. All right, let's continue. All right, thanks for uh, sharing that uh, nice fact about us. Mm -hmm. All right, so the uh, so millennials, yeah, we're millennials. Zoomers were born. Um, uh, the internet and computers and all that—that's that, all they've ever known. So they're kind of native to it. But the point here is that um, you got to look at the age distribution. So the Zoomers, there's less of them than the millennials. That's pretty obvious there um millennials hmm. boomers in the america they did something most other places didn't do they had children that's us and <laughs> other parts of the world boomers didn't have children so this is why america demographically has it good because if you don't always have more young people and the economy is always growing every year because there's more young people and more consumers to drive ever continued growth which is what every uh, uh economic system we have is based on um then that collapses and we don't really know exactly how that works japan is the one who's the most far ahead on that where they're kind of like a retirement home yeah i was going to say and that. they've found out they're they've kind of they haven't grown for a long time they've been stagnant but they found a way to kind of partner in other countries do a lot of exporting and they build their production in other countries and they hire local uh, labor to produce products. Uh, I was going to say, didn't um, Elon Musk say that in, uh, unless something changes and on Twitter, he did a tweet talking about Japan's population collapse because mm -hmm. uh, they're not having kids and everybody's super old. And he says, if it, if it continues, I believe it was Elon, I may be wrong, but if things continue this way, the Japanese people will cease to exist. Uh, somebody put that out there and it was a pretty prominent uh, thought. Did you see that? I did. Um, this is uh, Elon Musk is onto this. Um, he's been talking about population collapse and in other interviews. He said that um, this is the thing that he's most worried about. It's not nuclear war. It's not uh, some type of other event that's going to wipe us out. He's worried Jeez. that our population will just shrink so much that all the young will basically be enslaved to the old. <laughs> 
and we're going to kind of die out with a whimper and humanity will, we will never kind of, we can have a spiral. It's possible. We can have a spiral where uh, we're just not having replacement numbers and we could literally go extinct by not having enough children Ugh. or we can go down to such a small amount of people that we can't have an industrialized society. There's not enough people to specialize in all the numbers that we need hmm. to produce all kinds of all our products and services. So kind we like the, regress hmm. into like a, a low tech kind of it reminds world. me of how Medicaid and Medicare are failing. It's like we don't have enough money coming in. It's like this demographic war that's happening and we're about to lose it. And what was yes. it 10 years from now? Social Security is only funded up to 2047, I believe. And after that, um, it um, it doesn't it doesn't have funding. So something will have to change by then. The Great. thing is, um, if we made necessary changes now, I mean, us millennials would probably end up paying for it to keep it yep. going to for all right uh technical constraint there but as i was saying um the uh with social security um if we make a cut now it's going to go go on to us and um one thing we don't want to do is we don't want all of us all our parents to be moving back in with us when we get older because <laughs> we don't that you know the funding is already screwed up by then so hopefully gen xers will help pay for that um but uh, the main point I wanted to make was comparing between um, different um, countries here. So this is, uh, I only have two examples up, uh, you know, there are many, but here's the United States currently in 2025. And here is China. Now, China is Jeez. the most rapidly um, aging country in the world. Um, they enacted a uh, one child policy um, approximately 30 years ago, and mm -hmm. that thing worked. So um, at the time, uh, there was uh, a lot of young children, all this group up here that got 30 years older. Uh, this used to be all the young people. And um, the, at the time, the, 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 the leader was worried that there would be so many young people that they would overthrow him and the government would change. <laughs> so we thought, let me limit the population. It'll be a bit more manageable. I mean, this is China. We got billions of people. Like, we'll be okay. So maybe he thought. So the one-child policy was put into effect. That shit worked. Oh, so real uh, side note, you know, the Tiananmen Square thing, a ton of young Chinese course. people have no idea what happened there, where there was massive protest against them. And then it's heavy, heavy censorship in uh, China, yeah, they, especially there's short I mean, Russia as well. Yeah, there's short documentaries you can watch where uh, there's this one young college student going around on a college campus and uh, on the anniversary of Tiananmen Square. He's going, uh, yeah, you guys know what happened today? And they're, they're either clueless or the ones who do know are so scared of being on camera. They're like, I'm leaving right away. It's terrifying footage, like just seeing how much different China is with their, tyran uh, their tyranny and all that stuff versus the U.S. with our freedoms. We can say, hey, hey F you, Trump, or F you, yeah. Hillary. Yeah, I mean, we see that we're getting fucked over in a lot of ways, but at least it's more out in the open and we can talk about it. And yeah. there's a chance for it to change to, to get better versus a uh, big difference from the, the autocratic uh, mm -hmm. where they throw you in jail and uh, try to kill all their political rivals <laughs> instead of uh, just, you know, do dirty tricks and outfund them and stuff like that we do here. But at least there's a line, right? Yeah. So, uh, yeah, you know, the kids you know they got mm -hmm. that one guy stood in front of the tank and he got run over by the tank uh during that protest yeah that famous that's image a famous image it's probably the most famous image out of china history I, mm -hmm. I can't think of a more famous one yeah so uh anyways um yeah so um this all of this you see my mouse wiggle oh yeah i see it yeah so this is a big problem over there because you take this forward 20 years and everyone, this is what happens with industrialization. First of all, this is kind of backtracking, but the idea is Jeez. that 
when you were out in the farms, um, children were free labor and uh, we had a lot of them. And as you moved into the cities, um, children became expensive conversation pieces. Mm-hmm. So people aren't dumb. So they had less children when they moved into the city. <laughs> Um, add to that the one child policy on top of it, and you get something that looks like this. Instead of the healthy pyramid where there's always a younger, uh, more young people than old to balance things out, a lot of countries are starting to look like this top heavy, unstable kind of demographic. And what happens is that you have a shrinking tax base. The government doesn't have the same revenues to support, um, social, you know, services, government services, uh, infrastructure, um, you know, retirement, healthcare, uh, and industry producing things, you name it, everything Mm -hmm. comes down to population. So for this reason alone, everyone thinks China is has such a great future ahead of them, and they're beating everyone. But you can't fight your population, you can't fight demographics. And uh, immigration does help to a certain amount, Hmm. but China's not huge on immigration. There's not a ton of people emigrating to China. Uh, We go back to the aforementioned uh, people too terrified to talk on video uh, quote. Also, uh, I've heard that uh, they had a lack of regular toilets. They've always had like the Asian style of toilets. And so they've made a giant uh, effort to bring in more tourism by fixing their toilet problem. Cause like you gotta like, I think they got the type where you gotta mainly like squat in a hole, like right. in the bathroom. Like right. it's pretty common in Asia overall, but like Thailand when I, I was there, like they, there's no problem in the main areas at least that people want to go to. So China was trying to renovate themselves for tourism. I think uh, Thailand and Vietnam are going to do a lot better than China in the future for a lot of reasons. Um, uh, Toilet technology, notwithstanding, uh, they (laughs) also on top of that. Yeah, uh, they converted me. Uh, I I I consider anyone who doesn't have some form of bidet to be a filthy animal at this point. (laughs) I'm sorry, you are. It's like a massage. You walk around with feces on your body at all times of the day, (laughs) no matter how much you think you wipe. It uh, isn't. can't get it all mm-hmm. uh it's not uh for me no it's just the practicality and the cleanliness uh they they got that figured out there um so uh yeah um so that's one problem with china is that they have a rapidly aging population and they're basically in um another 20 30 years china's going to look like one big giant retirement home you know <laughs> Not a lot going on in those places, you know. <laughs> Crazy. <laughs> so, uh, so they got that is uh, coming down the pipe, and uh, they got some other issues as well. What, how does Japan com- uh, compare to China's? I know it's similar, but like it's not that severe versus China's, or uh, no, uh, they are even more advanced uh, than China actually. No, I mean, um, I mean about the old people the getting too old. Demo- yeah, yep, the age. That's stuff. what I'm talking about. Yeah. Oh, that is they are worse than China in that, but uh, Japan is much better on the food and the energy uh, subjects, which hmm. uh, will try to circle around to eventually Uh, so japan's going to be okay for that and for other kind of geographic and political uh, reasons Um, but let's look at this this is uh average wage uh measured in us dollars per month um uh of different countries and um you could see here that um america's closest trading partner mexico is in the green uh, right here. And um, Mexico is basically like the best country border in us we could have hoped for. <laughs> uh, we got really lucky. Um, their demographics are much healthier. They still have a lot of younger people being born all the time, which hmm. means they're a consumer economy. When, uh, when you have one uh, country that has all older demographics, mm-hmm. They, they don't have, it's when, it's only when you're young that you're consuming things. You're, you think about it, you're, uh, you're buying cars, you're, uh, you're spending money on things, you're buying clothes. If you're having kids, you're buying, you know, diapers. Midlife crises. 
Yeah, <laughs> new cars. Uh, you know, depend on uh, your your situation. You know, you're spending a lot of money. As you get older, you tend to save more. You know, you see retirement coming, and um, you realize that that money is going to stop if you have half a brain <laughs> and they start to put away a little more money and they try to squirrel it away so that they're good into retirement and uh, they can make it. It's like philosophically, they don't care as much like older people. They don't care about getting the newest clothing to look good or the best makeup or the best cologne. A lot of them, a lot of them at least. So. That is true too. I think, uh, you, don't you think, I think it's related a bit to like the mating dance. <laughs> yeah. Don't you Pretty think much. like exactly. you, know, you have to you have to look good, you have to puff up for the mating dance to attract a, a partner as part of it, right? I mean, uh that does and also, you know, if you have kids, you end up spending a lot on kids, but once they eventually get to old enough, you know, hopefully they eventually get self sufficient <laughs> and then mm -hmm. uh, you just stop spending money on them. So it's kind of like a twofold thing. Yeah, you spend less uh for various reasons. Um so so Mexico doesn't have that problem. They have a lot of consumers. So when you're older, though, um, you don't have enough consumers to support uh, producing all these products that you make for your economy. So what you what do you got to do? You got to sell them somewhere else. You got to sell them to another country that has more young people. So that's global trade kind of in a nutshell, uh, excluding energy and food. Um, mm -hmm. So we do that. Um, uh we're kind of kind of balanced in the u.s so we don't uh export as much was which is one of the reasons that like we're going to be okay in the future as this whole kind of thing breaks down so i know i'm going all over the place so <laughs> there is a good story here about why like globalization came around is kind of in this world war ii just the American Navy survived and we became like the security guarantors of the world mm -hmm. and everyone was allowed to trade. And so all these countries were able to get things from everywhere and the lowest cost place. And uh, we made sure that no one blew up the ships and, you know, everything was hunky dory. Yeah. But COVID happened and Russia invading Ukraine is Ugh, happening. Horrible. And we've had... Um, uh, four presidents in a row now that uh, are no longer interested in a global uh, plan and global trade. We don't, the Soviet Union is, it's kind of like it's last gas. We won the Cold War. Yeah, and, uh, economically more than anything. Yeah, what, we've been voting for, for presidents that are less interested in global trade and, and uh, global cooperation. So we're kind of pulling back. We have less troops out everywhere over time. People don't want it anymore. They yeah. they kind of sense that we're going to be okay. So we got Mexico to trade with. They're kind of in the middle. Their wages are uh, normal. The uh, big takeaway here is notice how fast China's wages have gone up uh, over the years. It's been the most rapidly increasing. Um, this is in a large part due to um, their age demographics where um, they have... Hmm. Um, older uh workers bring the average up because you get more experience you become more of a value add and um then you get uh tend to get paid more so yeah. manufact so the um the myth of cheap china labors has been going away for actually many years now Jeez, you know that yeah and um this might surprise you as well with Mexico is uh, emigration from Mexico. People coming over from there has been net negative for the last decade. Yeah, I know because there's so many coming from South America, uh, from the south border here uh, in the U.S. I know there's just like, t I mean, there's. I mean, and they that's ending over... soon, too, because hmm. they're getting older, so they won't have the young people in another five years to send up to us. You know, they already so the caught... caravans will also be going away. They, they caught all, already over 40 uh, people. I think it was 42 last I heard. That was like weeks ago of uh, people who are on the terror watch list where people who may commit terror strikes against the U.S., they caught 42 of them. How many have they not caught? You know, it's a crazy situation because you want to help people. You know, America is a good place. It's welcoming and they know it and that's why they're coming. But at the same time, if you're a politician, 
your loyalty should be to the population you're representing and not to everybody in the world. And so it's a tough situation. There's really no winning. If you shut down the border, you're not helping the other people in the world. I mean, you might be helping the Americans more and, you know, avoiding problems and drugs, fentanyls, porting, uh, importing like crazy over the border. And yeah, what do you think? Uh, well, actually, I mean, uh, if you want, um, if you don't want inflation, um, then you want immigration, uh, mm -hmm. without immigration, you get inflation. Um, so the funny thing is that's made a lot of fuss about it, but it's kind of a sideshow. It's not really that important in the grand scale of things. Mm -hmm. uh, we have uh, plenty of uh, violence from non-immigrants, uh, as if you look around at oh, the shootings right tons. now. Yeah, uh, no, I'm not saying they're bad. Little no. kids getting shot. Most of them are good um, people. You, you can't fit, uh, you know, they, they compare that to like M&Ms, like uh, here's a bowl of M&Ms. It's basically a political <laughs> talking point. It's really the fact of the matter is that people, more people are trying to get out of America into Mexico than the other way around. Mm-hmm. That's been the last decade. Probably a lot of people are, you know, choosing to retire where there's cheaper cost of living in Mexico and your dollar stretches uh, a bit longer, among other things. So true. Yeah, that's that's kind of the deal there. Um, so um, now there's a trend where manufacturing is going to be more localized. We saw the supply chains break down. And it's still happening in China because they have a vaccine that doesn't work over there. <laughs> Jeez. Uh, their vaccine does almost nothing now to uh, the newest uh, variant. So that's why they're doing these lockdowns, because uh, politically they can't afford to have mass people dying. Uh, they're too paranoid to about that. Did that you see those videos of like how hardcore they are of getting violence when people who are getting out of control, people are throwing refrigerators off their balconies because they're trapped inside of apartment buildings with no food. Uh, oh, man. It, I remember uh, during the initial lockdowns, there was a woman who ran out of food and she was locked inside the apartment building and it was a skyscraper. So she was trying to scale the outside of the building and she fell to her death because she was trying to find food in a way that she, you know, the only way she could scaling the outside of the building. I mean, China's messed up. And I'm here to tell you that it's going to get much worse. Ugh. Not just in China, but everywhere. Yeah, this but especially close. in China, especially <laughs> in China, um, there's going to be a total breakdown of the of of the country of China probably won't exist as it is now in 50 years. And it's not going to go that way peacefully, because when people go hungry and the lights start getting turned out, people get violent and yeah. there's overthrows and there's more wars and you're going to see a lot of people dying in horrible ways. Not to mention starving to death. Yay. I haven't even gotten to explain that yet, but that's kind of where this is going. Ukraine, Russia stuff. Uh, I'm probably. still on the happy average wage stuff. Look, people's <laughs> uh, wages are going up. This is good. It's happy, right? <laughs> and yeah, now, you see why this, <laughs> now you see why this is the Half Dead Musings podcast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So this is not the the uplifting, uh, happy um, uh, podcast as a result of this data, because the data, the good news is that America, uh, we got very lucky. Uh, American geography is such that we're surrounded by two oceans. Uh, so that has we're taken a lot of, we've never, what are the major wars America has had? The, Civil uh, war is the worst, because every Civil casualty war, was American death. A war of uh, 1812, I think, and the Mexico War, which we won and took a bunch of land away from Mexico. Uh, and that's it, three. And then if you look at a list of European wars, there's like 200. Oh, that's, right? they call them the old world for that reason. And I, I was just yeah. listening to the uh, hard, the latest hardcore history, and it's all about slavery. And I, I'm not going to go too deep into this right now. But yeah, yeah please, because I'm just on one the first part of this. Exactly. <laughs> I, I'm just saying they call it the old world versus the new world. The new world was underdeveloped and... The Native Americans had like a almost like a childlike innocence about them. They were amazing. They 
uh, would live in harmony with nature. And, um, you know, it's, it's really horrible what happened to them and everything, but all right, go ahead. Yeah. I mean, they're sticking it with, uh, to us with the casinos now. <laughs> uh, wait until you hear the stuff that I'm talking about. You'll see, maybe it's a fair trade, not even fair. <laughs> no, I know it's, yeah. it's bad for them. Yeah. It was um, horrible. It's definitely not fair actually. <laughs> so geographically, right. So, we don't have threats from where we can be unified because of our geography, because it's a lot of open flat land that can be easily joined together. So that allowed us to have a single cultural identity for the most part. There are divisions that are, there's going to be a shakeup politically over the next eight years as the Democrat and Republican party. What that means is going to change because the groups that have typically been associated with either Democrat or Republican, are flipping sides like you have oh, unions yeah. used to be democrat now they're becoming more republican uh you have uh, everyone on the on the axis of social um liberalism to conservatism uh, con uh, examine uh, uh, imagine that on like an x-axis and a y-axis is <laughs> the economic um conservatism to liberal and you have you could be in one corner you can be in the other corner of the two extremes and one corner you think that um um starvation is builds good character and food stamps <laughs> should be illegal and at the other end you believe that um we should all just uh get along man and uh you know st stay away from you know my body and and but uh, we're all going to smoke pot and everything's going to be OK with socialism. What do you think about the free speech shift? Because uh, I forget where it was in California. Uh, I think it was at Berkeley or something like that, where it was like the center for free speech back. Uh, I think it was the 70s or 60s. And uh, it was the Democrats who were all about free speech. And then now everything's shifted. The Democrats are the ones trying to shut down speech. They shout you down instead of hearing what you have to say. And uh, well, that's the thing. It's uh, you say it's Democrat. Uh, Democrats are trying to shout people down, but um, it's you're talking about social media, right? That and more. Like in person, people on college campuses. There was a conservative talking about the trans. Uh, the trans rights issues involving, I, I believe it was sports or it might have been something else, but uh, he went there to pres like have a, a civil conversation and this entire classroom, there's a video of it, they just start chanting and screaming and they refuse to hear even a single word out of his mouth uh, in order, and I, yeah, oh, I think it was a, that's what it was, it was a, a father and this guy uh, had a kid and then it was uh, the mom wanted to convert the kid to be trans and the father said no and then the father lost i believe it was and then that's where this guy started going on tour and trying to educate the public about it like father's rights versus mother's rights uh the trans issue who, who gets to decide what's best for the kid and then the the liberal uh college would not even hear a word they were just screaming and pounding on their desks like crazy yeah that's uh that's a trend uh you know, uh, I can't speak for one side or the other, uh, but yeah. uh, I know that uh, there's some countries in Europe have uh, really scaled back on allowing this trans thing on children because you're so young and it has these long lasting effects on the rest of your life. Yeah. Um, you know, that uh, it's uh, kids are kind of go along with all kinds of things and exactly. kind of dumb so you could just think oh i'll be popular if i'm say i'm, I'm a trans you know woman or whatever i need to be a woman i'm a guy so <laughs> then they'd get the thing and then you know whatever that maybe they're okay still but it had a big effect on the rest of their lives and this is like a whole messy new yeah. thing where we have the technology now where you could change your sex you know yeah. this is as technology advances, we're going to run into a lot of questions like this, kind of like uh, down the road, it's going to be uploading your brain. And, you know, if you're a, uh, yeah. a soul in a machine, do you still count as a living person? <laughs> what about a robot that has intelligence? Like, you know, yeah. and it's, you know, you change your sex and then is it's it going to be like free open sex between like half sexes? And you're going to be able to change your sex back and forth and, you know, uh, yeah. 
So that's a, that's a, <laughs> needs some working out. It's a messy process, and it's gonna be messed uh, up. I definitely, I'd like uh, you know hearing more debate and open information should be a thing. There's also a thing with tech companies with censorship, and you have instances of violence, and you want to prevent violence, but you you yeah. need like law. There's no laws uh, passed by Congress about a lot of this stuff, which is why the tech companies are just like have to make up their own decision about it basically because there's no guidance from the fed from the government so without mm -hmm. that guidance they it's a free-for-all so they just have to they do whatever they think is best well and, free speech uh, is supposed to be you know the the law of the land except for a few exceptions like yeah I, it's I never heard... really been free speech hmm well yeah that, that's why we i like, like to say it. it's a it's a great thing and we all believe in it but well, never really been a thing. If, if you if you look at the U.S. versus uh, England, the U.K. and Australia, England and the I mean the U.K. and Australia have way more hard line approaches to inconvenient journalists. I, I like especially in Australia. Australia they were they're messed up what they do over there. Like they during the COVID lockdowns, there there's videos of the police like attacking women in the streets and. I mean, they were over the top. We I mean, see a lot of police violence in the United States, too. Yeah, but it wasn't over just a woman just walking down the black. street. During, it was a woman. <laughs> no, no, it was a white woman walking down the street uh, during the lockdowns. And uh, she, they were like, no, you're not supposed to be out here. And then they like there's some very vi uh, violent footage of the police over there just attacking people over very minor things. Nothing that American police would even touch anybody over. Uh, oh, please. Before. American people with the uh, American police would touch people for the same thing. We no, didn't uh, have strict lockdowns there that enabled them to do that. There would they didn't get a directive from, you know, the top that, hey, there, uh, there was like a, a lockdown, but we didn't mandate that people had to stay in their homes like they did in other countries. If they were told and that was the law and their ass was covered, 100% you'd see American cops would be beating the shit yeah. out of U.S. citizens yeah, because a bunch of them are just on a power trip. Yeah. So they, they love that. that they'll, yeah, they'll enforce, they they'll enforce whatever. They'll enforce whatever. I mean, look at bosses. what happened in Uvalde, Texas. Uh, you had these yeah. uh, cops who were. Um, so, I'm so sick of Jokes. like the cops getting such a pass on everything. You what had a, these cops were that were scared cops. to go in, and not only are they scared to go in, and then they lie, and then they they are always about covering their own ass and trying to make themselves look as good as possible, mm -hmm. uh, regardless of what actually happens. So they lie about it, yeah, the and they actively prevent other people from going in to save their own kids. And uh, you had, uh, you know, police tasing women, mothers, you know, keep forcibly yeah, beating them up, up and handcuffing them. When well, they just want to go in to save their kids, they're going to do the job that you're supposed to do. Did and you, uh, you're, the, the job, number one job of police is compliance. They will always be compliance. You know, that's that's how it is right now. Yeah. Did you hear but, about the, the hero mother who actually ran in, jumped the fence and I, ran in? Yeah, she, she, got, she got her kids, right? Yeah, exactly. She got to her yeah. two kids. She knew where they were at. And yeah, uh, yeah also, the, I don't know if it's an excuse or what, but now the commander's official story is he didn't have his uh, walkie-talkie or whatever on him. And so they were getting these critical messages and the command. I, I, and then, listen, they stopped communicating. This story is going to change, like, you know, from one minute to the other. Uh, you know, but this investigation, these the, the commander and the police force in the town, I believe it was, they're not communicating with the external uh, invest the investigatory, or is that the right word? <laughs> the investigation committee from, I believe it was the external uh, state that was coming in and looking at things. But, uh, yeah, the police are no longer even communicating with their own state right. because they're so scared of the uh, legal repercussions behind this because they know they messed up. So Yep. Makes sense. They, uh, they will do what they do. But uh, back to the geography. So um, as I was saying, um, we have uh, two oceans and we have um, a lot of flat plains. And we have uh, a lot of river systems that allow cheap transportation of goods. And we've got, um, you know, two neighbors that are good allies of ours with uh, kind of, you know, Mexico economy is very complementary, And um, the uh, Canada economy is integrated into ours. So that's pretty good manufacturing wise, but um, not the case for Europe, uh, not the case for a lot of other, other countries uh, like China. 
Uh, let me just see whatever. Okay, so this will get us into energy. Can we talk about energy a little cool. bit with oil? So, um, so this um, shows the uh, path of oil trade uh, around the world. And the more lines there are, um, the more oil is going there. So um, here's Russia. Um, as you could see, um, they are supplying uh, a good chunk of oil and natural gas to Europe, um, especially to Germany and uh, Turkey, uh, which are two uh, of the biggest NATO powers. Um, they have two of the biggest militaries. And Germany is going to probably be faced with a crisis of, um, hey, um, we could keep your lights on with keeping selling you the gas, but uh, you know you're gonna have to you're gonna have to cut a deal with us. And same thing with you, Turkey. And uh, if Germany and Turkey end up doing that, uh, mm -hmm. Russia is gonna want them to under undermine NATO. Um, so we'll see. So far, Europe is held together pretty pretty strong uh fingers crossed and uh they everyone's been surprised by the uh the yeah. unified amount of sanctions uh they've uh, they've been put out against this um have you heard we'll about see uh, quick, if they Tur do though uh, have you heard of turkey's resistance towards uh finland and what was it sweden uh joining nato Tur turkey's yes. the holdout what do you yes uh turkey's going to want some concessions from um uh from sweden finland because um i believe they supply uh some weapons to an enemy of uh turkey uh the kurds mm. i think um so um everyone's they're gonna learn now the sweet you know it's gonna every country kind of thinks from their own point of view and they're not don't necessarily think of other countries points of views until it really directly affects them yep. so this was never a problem for those countries before but now because any country in nato has veto power uh they're gonna have to consider to have those considerations for turkey and i imagine those will get smoothed out because it's not a, a a huge thing but it's uh, basically something that they're gonna have to, to switch up to get in what, what, um, i think it might be better for peace if finland and sweden don't join nato because that's like a provocation against the russians at this point and also the the u.s uh it, the most recent controversy in this war is the u.s was going to give these like medium range uh long range weapon type uh, things and uh russia said if the u.s gives that to ukraine we're going to start striking other locations as well they left it kind of vague they said other locations does, does, does that mean like in ukraine or are they talking about potentially hitting other countries as well like it, it's a scary threat so i wonder if the u.s would back down and not provide those weapons it's going to take like i think a week or two to get everybody trained to use them here's the thing according to experts um russia is kind of destined there they were going to move into uh nato countries no matter what uh the us did or anyone else did because of geography mm -hmm. so um ever since uh catherine the great um they had a strategy where uh, they had to plug up all these uh, geographic points of entry um to their country um and uh, in the old soviet union they controlled them all but after that broke down and they lost the cold war they retreated and um they don't they control barely any of those points hmm. so, but if you look at all the recent invasions they've did they've basically been plugging up these 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 routes of entry that historically armies have used to invade russia russia has been invaded many times over the history of the country and their demographics are almost as bad as China's, where um, they're also having mm. much less children. They had a flight of people out of Russia. Um, the they're really not very healthy in Russia. Um, yeah, there's uh, the uh, people die much younger, so their population is rapidly shrinking. They kind of stopped investing money into their education system. Um, they are kind of going down the toilet. <laughs> um and uh it kind of makes sense that putin saw this and russian people seem to kind of think this way too that this is kind of the last decade 
where Russia will actually have enough men in the yeah. right age brackets heard about to that. even be soldiers and to even have any chance of expanding to these territories that they know they want to plug up. They're only going to get and weaker from here on in. Yeah, exactly. So if they yeah. were able, while they still have strength, to expand and to plug up these different uh, areas, you could control these points of entry with a much smaller army. That's the whole point of um, mm -hmm. trying to secure these choke points. Yeah. And these choke points extend, two of them are beyond Ukraine, and they'd also would have to invade Poland and several other countries in NATO. And um, so it's like 20 other countries. It's like, it's like a total uh, amount of people that's like a double or triple the population of Russia that they would basically have to subjugate to get to the point where they feel secure and meet their end goal. Um, mm -hmm. So, oh, oh yeah, I was going to say, I, I saw a documentary, like a mini one, and it showed that due to geographical uh, features over there, whether it's the mountains or whatever, Ukraine is the by far the most important country for the defense of Russia from ground troops of any other country coming from the West. And so it's a big country and it's uh, they got Crimea was a major yeah. sea sea point. Yeah. And then there's two other major choke points beyond Ukraine. So it is it's three in one. Oh, yeah. So, I mean, it, it's literally the most important territory for Russia to control in order to defend uh, against foreign invaders and uh like also remember that they were always going this way so yeah. there's a story that like you know if we hadn't you know started nato and all these other countries started joining nato that was backing the russians into a corner yeah and this is what caused this and they're not wrong but they're just stupid people who <laughs> say that because russia was going to do this anyways so yeah you could have not had a conflict with nato but they still would have invaded these other countries and they still would have, um, you know, that's not great for those people. <laughs> what what but, do you think about Finland, though? Finland and, uh, joining NATO, do you think it's a good thing or a bad thing? I don't know. It feels. Uh, uh, I think it is a good thing overall. Like, you know, they're all will stand better together. And the alternative is them just being invaded yeah. and uh, being picked off. Uh, so which do you consider better? It's yeah. obviously for them. That's what for they them, choose. Certainly better. Yeah. The thing is, yeah, once they get into a fight with NATO, that gets everyone into it, including the United States. Ugh. So it ramps up big time. The thing is. That'd be horrible. With conventional weapons, we could see we obviously win. Like they're having trouble with Ukraine. <laughs> it's not everyone thought Ukraine was gonna fall over in the first month. Not the case. They, they thought they're the struggling. first week. They thought the first week. They remember they sent the assassins to kill Zelensky, and yeah. like uh, all, wave after wave of assassins yeah. got killed. <laughs> <laughs> Guy's a badass. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder yeah, if he choked cool. out any with his own bare hands. Did, did you know he was a dancer <laughs> on like a reality TV show? I knew like he dancing, was a comedian, but but like uh, on Dancing with the Stars, like Something Zelensky like that, was right? on their version of Dancing with the Stars. So he goes from Dancing with, <laughs> with the Stars to like <laughs> yeah, fighting off one of the three biggest countries in the planet, and like like doing it with balls of steel too. You yeah, got badasses can guy. dance too, you know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we got <laughs> anyone has, uh, has got some style can dance and some uh, athletics yeah um so you know so yeah so they're struggling with ukraine here and uh so if they come up to nato they're gonna get their asses handed to them yeah no question at this point even though they got a lot more people bodies to throw at this the russian style is kind of like grinding throwing bodies at it they don't care <laughs> about casualties yeah. those we're not gonna have enough people anyway soon actually if you have a shrinking population and things are going to start failing you're better off not having a bunch of young men around because they're going to fuck shit up once they get unhappy mm. better they get killed off it's easier <laughs> to control the population yeah that's <laughs> seriously actually, yeah I, I never thought about it like that they but are yeah. totally happy with that as autocratic leaders so during the french revolution napoleon actually was a young man and the first time that he ever saw any person be killed at all was when he arrived over there and he was seeing such chaos in the streets 
And so, yeah, it was the, the young men who actually did lead that revolution. And so I could see where Russia is coming from or any country in the world is coming from. Oh, yeah, there's to tons of the examples in history. Yeah, where, yeah, who's gonna start it? A bunch of housewives? Mm -hmm. No offense, you know, women power and all that. But, you know, <laughs> look at the, you know, Arab Spring was because uh, food prices doubled and all because only 10% of the of the uh, food supply was uh, was cut out at that point. And we had, you know, 9-11 and we had all these terrorists pop up out of the region as all these young men who are, uh, you know, pissed off and hungry and uh, they turn to violence. And yeah. uh, that's nothing compared to what's coming down the pipeline with food, by the way. I haven't gotten to food yet. We're uh, still talking about war. Let's get to it. That's going to lead to more war, too, by the way. But this is just the yeah. Russia-Ukraine war we're still in, right? So, so obviously, uh, if Russia gets past Ukraine, then they're going to go up against NATO countries. They're going to get wrecked. Now, here's the scary part is that I think that the United States and the other big NATO countries have realized that this will happen, and they've thought one step ahead. They realize that if... Russia just continues on because it kind of seems like they have no choice, especially at this point, and we beat them. What options do they have at that point? Mm. They have a total defeat where they have to retreat with heavy losses way inside their borders, or they use nukes. Yeah, that's a scary part. At that point, it's a whole nother level. New oh, uh, I believe russia was saying they promised not to use small tactical nukes and they were accusing the west of being more likely to use the small scale tactical nukes but in history double I speak believe, yeah I, I remember in history remember uh i believe i may have mentioned it in one of our previous podcasts but after the bay of pigs happened russia had tactical small scale nukes on cuba awaiting the next uh the bay of pigs number two basically so the american troops would have been nuked uh but thankfully everything you know everybody uh chilled out and peace prevailed afterwards so so if russia ends up using nukes uh you know obviously america the allies have plenty of nukes every country that has a nuclear reactor can have nuclear uh, weapons inside of a year because mm -hmm. once you have that tech, it's not a big leap to get the nuclear weapons. So you can better believe that the NATO countries are going to be arming up with more nukes at this point, not less. We were heading to less nukes overall. There's going to be a buildup of more nukes, yeah. more tension, higher chance. And obviously nuclear war, everyone gets wiped out. You know, no one lives. End of story. Elon, sorry, you didn't quite make it to get us off the planet before we blew ourselves up. I know you're trying very hard to get us to Mars so humanity would survive, even if we yep. killed ourselves. But in that case, you didn't quite make it. That would be sad. Um, but we'd be dead or we'd be dying of radiation and wanting to kill ourselves. So yeah, uh, we wouldn't be care too up. much at that point. Um, so I think that uh, the NATO countries have realized this and we really don't want Russia to get past Ukraine and yeah. for it to get to that point now. So the best thing that we could do is that we need to pour as many non-nailed down weapon systems, anything that doesn't require a direct NATO presence that can then be attacked to trigger a NATO war needs to be sent to Ukraine. So to make it a killing field that mm. basically murders the entire Russian army Terrible. so that they can't push on to start a nuclear war. Yeah, the only way we, we don't get the, the uh, I mean, it's not guaranteed we get nuclear war, but the odds go up dramatically. So the mm -hmm. only way to really safeguard against the threat of nuclear war is that the Russian army has to die in Ukraine. Yeah, and there's so many of them that like, oh, oh, uh, speaking of that, I just saw there was a Russian commander who was complaining that they were being sent illegal troops, even according to Russia standards, young kids. They're getting diseased. They got not enough food or supplies. 
they're in hell basically and this is a commander on on the uh, front right there in ukraine who was saying this so and also think of i think it was over 10 commanders uh, is that what the rank was called but like some of the or generals some of the highest They're officers right? yeah off well, even higher than officers there was right. like higher. major like c commanders or uh, whatever they were but uh, there's been over 10 of them already killed. And so, and their flagship, the Russian flagship has been sank. And so like the flagship, meaning the leader of the ships back in the old days, they used to call it the flagship because they would uh, bring up flags to communicate with the other ships near them in order to, you know, maneuver, do certain, you know, retreat, or you're going to swoop around or whatever you're going to do. Now and, it's kind of just the biggest, baddest ship in any fleet. Yeah. Is called the flagship, right? Yeah. Pretty much the leader of the best ship of the best, basically. And yeah. it was uh, taken down recently, right? And it was built in Ukraine. Oh, was it? It was like a couple months ago now, I mm -hmm. think. Uh, yeah. Maybe a month and a half ago or something. That yeah. was big news. Yeah, time's flying. It's all blurring together with this thing. Oh, by the way, real quick, I, I don't know how to get us big on the screen. I've been trying. I don't know. I'm just looking at your desktop and your computer, your Steam and everything. So if you could find a way to get oh, us no. big. Oh, no. should have told me that. Yeah. Um, so I've been trying to hit all these buttons to try to get us both big on the screen. But you see, this is Zoom learning curves. Oh, there we go. I thought it was uh, on my end. I thought I could control that. That's why I didn't say anything. But all right, we'll be all right. How about if I go back? We're good. No, it was perfect. How is this now it. sharing the screen? Is this okay? Yeah, now? We're, we're perfect now. Uh, I can see the uh, slides again and uh, us. Uh, we're small. All right. so, all Hopefully right. I, I always get burned because I'm always scared sharing my desktop. So I'm always giving away personal info. <laughs> Hopefully <laughs> I was looking not like weird. You could blur it out. No, I, I, I didn't see out. anything weird. I, I would have said that right away. And then I would have been screaming and running around the room. No. <laughs> all right go ahead all right well um oh oh before you start actually uh at this oil chart i just got done re-listening to the hardcore history from world war one and uh in world war one was the time when they realized that they were going to start getting away from coal as like a, a fuel versus oil and so that's when everybody started this oil craze and uh, the Middle East became a major player. Speaking of the Middle East, I'm looking at it right here with sure. all their oil exports. Oil is what yeah. uh, allowed a lot of the world to really industrialize to levels they couldn't before. And oil is, um, it's not just the, the energy component, of course. Uh, coal, yeah, you can get electricity but you need oil for transportation. You need that mm -hmm. for trucks and cars to make gasoline. So uh, if you don't have oil, you can't have an industrial society. And you couldn't yet, have war. At least. In World War One. you couldn't have like enough fuel Or at for least the, the industrialized companies, uh, countries would totally decimate the non-industrialized countries. So mm -hmm. it was no contest. That's why you basically had like local power groups back then when the technology wasn't even. And then we kind of got safe for a while. We went out into globalization and free trade and yay. <laughs> and now it's all kind of, well, we're, that's going away. And we're going to shrink back to more local powers again. And you're going to see countries will be fucking with this oil supply. That's why these routes are kind of important. So America is going to be fine. We uh, can produce a bunch of oil from our shale uh thing came up and shale is actually hmm. it's like can be run by mom and pop operations you can have a ton of them you don't even need big companies like what is that shale shale that's fracking is shale oh okay yeah i never heard uh, shale. Fracking, fracking is the, the deposits are called shale deposits and they're all over uh they're close to population centers and america has a ton of them what, what about geothermal um it's great if you have it but uh, some places are better than others. I don't mm. think America is great for it. Um, mm. uh, otherwise, we probably would have done it. But um, certain places are, like Argentina, um, and they're going to be doing well in the future. Um, and shale oil is uh, light and um, sweet. Um, there's like a heavy sour to light sweet gradient uh, if you, uh, in the oil business. Mm -hmm. And um, that is a, it requires less refining. 
uh, which is a good thing. Although you do have to have a refinery tuned to a certain kind, yeah. but um, so um, and you use it for a lot of products. Uh, like I was saying, not just transport, but oh, we have a lot of things made from oil. It's uh, a natural gas. Is uh, it's like half of the products you look around in your room. There's oil and natural gas is used to make almost everything. Hmm. You just look around and like anything that's like plastic, yeah. you know, that's oil and natural gas, um, all kinds of uh, like, uh, yeah, about you know, everything. I, yeah, I'm not an expert. There's like, there's tons of products that we use. So, um, uh, so uh, we are going to be okay because we can ramp up and we can have enough oil to supply ourselves. Uh, Canada and Mexico are going to be okay with us. Um, Europe is going to have some issues, but they can get some stuff mm. from Africa is nearby. Angola so be okay. and Nigeria. I'm looking at it. It looks yeah, like a lot see, comes from so there. So the, the ones who are going to have the big problems are the ones where they're kind of have a long way for the oil to get to them. And especially the ones who are last in the line. So obviously this is the Middle East. A lot of oil comes out of there. Man. And it goes around here. Uh, this big country is India. Yeah. It goes around Sri India. Sri Lanka right there at the bottom of India. The little island who's getting wrecked right now. Okay. And then um, it goes uh, through here. Um, goes by um, Japan. And uh, ends up in um, China. Um, Man, Japan. Look or, at how or, far. Or this is Japan, right? Yeah, that's Japan. Japan. How yeah. far? Look at how far the oil has to come from to get to Japan. There's nobody yeah. else in the world who has it come from further, right? No. And the thing is that it has to go by these countries with big navies. So once the United <laughs> States uh, steps out of the way and we're not going to get involved with other countries' conflicts, India can just go ahead and park a couple like destroyers out on the uh, off the shore here and they can cut off any oil that's flowing east <laughs> so all china Jesus. and the southeast asian countries are fucked yeah they they, they will be forced to deindustrialize because they will not get enough oil japan will actually be okay because um they have a deep water navy and they are able to kind of go take the long route they can go all the way around and they can get oil all the way from their close partner, the U.S. Um, I was going to say about Japan real quick. The reason why they attacked Pearl Harbor is because the oil. Um, yep, the massive embargoes oil was one of the major prime reasons. But they were also getting suffocated from all sorts of uh, other materials as well. And they were similar to how Russia is now with their demographic problem where this is the time where they're going to be at their strongest that was where Japan was. They didn't see a time period after the war. They just saw, oh man, we're losing all the oil. We need to carry out this war. We got to strike now. And uh, there's a lot of people who say that they knew it, that uh, an attack was coming to the U.S. or against the U.S., but they didn't know exactly where or when. But the U.S. got lucky, and it was all of our old ships, that, uh, not the cutting edge ones, that got destroyed at Pearl Harbor. Mm -hmm. So... All right, go ahead. Yeah. So, wow. Yeah. Great example because uh, this, you can point to the same thing with Russia and Ukraine now. They're kind of in the same situation. And um, uh, it's a little different. It's more about defense and strategy for Russia. And for them, it was more about resources. But basically, most of the wars in the history of the world is because to have a country, an, an industrialized country, you need to be close to the energy and close to the food. And uh, countries that have access to both within their borders, they're okay. If you don't, you have to get it from somewhere else. And that means you need to take it from someone else. And they don't like that. So you have a war. So in this case, China, they built up a Navy, but all their boats are short range. And they, basic, they can't get more than a thousand miles um, off of the coast of China. It basically was designed to keep someone from invading their mainland and to maybe take Taiwan one day. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't seem like it's going to happen anymore uh, unless they get really desperate. But it's after seeing what happened with Russia and Ukraine, um, if 
a China try to do the same thing now with Taiwan, as you could see, the U.S. could easily park a couple of our super carriers and cut off all the oil to China <laughs> and all the food. This You might as well have another line here that is with food as well, kind of almost the same thing as the oil. China imports like 75% of its calories that it needs for people to survive. Whoa. So you cut off their oil and you cut off their food and next year you have half a million or you have um 500 million people starving in china mm. and the sad thing is that it's kind of like with just the fact of the the russian oil and food cut off as it is now apparently ukraine was able to do a bit more planting than people expected i think they were able to plants three quarters of what they usually do because they you know you have a certain window you have to plant in the in the spring and the summer and then you harvest in the fall um so if you miss your window then you don't have that food mm -hmm. and a lot of the world relies on that food oh also fertilizer yeah um, you need oil and natural gas to make fertilizer and if you don't have fertilizer for your crops uh, your crops are much less productive and they uh, yield much less food. You know, Spain has already been preparing for a uh, food shortage for like since the very beginning of the war, practically. Like the, the, there's so many and places. They're very wise to because yeah. it is, it's coming and it's not, the worst of it is, is yet to come. Yeah, it's sad that Africa has so much like great fruits and vegetables and stuff, but they export like everything and then like the locals are starving and they're going to get, you know, hit the hardest the same way that, you know, Africa was the center of the slave trade. They get the they get hit the hardest and uh, yeah, it's messed up. Yeah, continue. It is. Uh, the amount of human suffering that is out around the corner is kind of kind of mm. staggering so kind of uh, if you look at the food and the oil you can kind of and the amount of it where it's like five million barrels a day of oil from russia is not only going to be shut off by ukrainian sappers uh, or uh embargoes and uh companies also being um swayed by um, their shareholders and um, uh, kind of social ESG concerns there to leave Russia. They had experts who were mining some of their oil operations uh, and now they left and Russians don't have the technical skill hmm. to keep those refineries even running, especially in the eastern parts in Serbia, where uh, it's always like it's a permafrost and um, those are supplying China. Those are going to slowly... Um, uh dwindle down over time mm. but the ones that are going east they're going to be disrupted and uh the way it works with their oil supply lines is that once those oil lines slow down and they get to a point where they're slow enough because they're in the tundra they're in the permafrost they they freeze and they expand wow. and the pipes break and the wells get wrecked forever mm -hmm. and you have to drill a new well and the last time this happened it took russia a decade to get to the <laughs> capacity they used to have Jeez, that means that the russian oil is basically gone forever it's good for over 10 years kiss it goodbye <laughs> it reminds me of the fall of the roman empire in a way where it took a thousand years for humanity to get back to the same standard of uh, civilization with the aqueducts and everything that the roman empire had it took a thousand years to restore that to, man that's messed obviously, up obviously it shouldn't be as bad now yeah. but it is seeming like another cycle of that where mm -hmm. we have this globalized system where everyone was able to, to have this great expansion and industrialize and start having better living conditions but many countries are so reliant on other countries giving them the food and the energy they need to keep the lights on and to keep fed that uh, they made themselves very vulnerable to any disruption of that supply and now that that supply is disrupted um, you're going to have a lot of countries like in africa and especially China, East Asia, and Africa are going to be the worst ones hit 
Uh, they're not going to have enough fertilizer. They're not going to have enough oil. They're not going to have enough food. So they're not going to be able to keep the lights on. And uh, people are going to go into starvation. And worst case scenario, uh, food prices can begin um, going up by four or five times in the fourth quarter of this year. And next year, we could see mass starvations Ugh. or we could lose up to a billion people. In all over the world? Yeah, or... globally. Ugh. You know, uh, real quick, a side tangent, the most fascinating thing that I never knew, uh, I've been listening to that hardcore history, like I mentioned, uh, the newest one, he pointed out in that that uh, the slave trade off, uh, off the coast of Africa, you would think, you know, it's horrible conditions when they're packed into the ships and uh, travel, you know, to the U.S. or to the Caribbean to work, uh, you know, as slaves. But the worst thing that nobody ever talks about is they would gather Africans and they would force them into the ships that are just offshore of Africa. And be, I mean, they would wait for the ship to get full just before leaving. There. Yep. They mm -hmm. would sit there, but not even for a week, not even a month, not two months. I mean, the, the average times were like three or four months of sitting in this ship. And this ship was the worst like prison imaginable. And they're chained up and you're surrounded and you have kids with you sometimes they say and then you're all sharing the same like, you know, place where you get a pee and crap in there. And then some they say it was so overpopulated in there that sometimes the it's kids like would, factory uh, factory farming for humans. Uh, it was horrible. Like and the, the the kids would fall into the crap pits and stuff and like uh I say it in a weird way, but <laughs> yeah, it's horrible though. Like, and also, I'm sorry, <laughs> <laughs> it's horrible. But it's horrible. Yeah, like, and the other thing is, is the uh, amount of uh, humidity. Drowning, died, died by drowning in shit. It's not a great way to go. Yeah, they didn't die though. They would pull them out, and I don't oh, think okay. the kids died or nothing. Then it is a happy thing. It's not like happy, just... definitely. Not. <laughs> <laughs> I just have a way with words sometimes. <laughs> Crap pit. <laughs> okay, I get. The, I can see a little in the word choices, but uh, definitely not yeah. a funny situation. Um, <laughs> yeah, we laughed. Yeah, and but uh, the other thing that you don't consider is it how hot it is, and uh, they're in there for months, and then the humidity from the sweating of the bodies alone creates this like tropical atmosphere pretty much where you could it's so hard to even breathe in the bottom of these ships and stuff i mean it's as horrific as you can possibly imagine basically so that was like something that they don't teach you in school like uh, as always hardcore history delivers the real truths and he's always fascinated about the extremes of human con of the human condition and uh so i it's free anybody who wants to seek it out and listen to it it's just go to hardcore history it's uh, free to listen it's called human resources so all right yeah, when to go to the next to, slide uh, see uh you know yeah. see uh the human suffering gives you a little perspective yeah. on uh, your own situation you know maybe you could feel a little bit better about yourself too yeah, that's what that's what people who watch horror movies all the time. I think that's the reason why they like it the most. You see all these people getting like cut up and murdered and stuff. It's like, hey, I'm still here. I'm just chilling on my bed. <laughs> yeah, I feel more alive. I'm alive yeah. than they aren't. Yeah, and it also goes to that thing where it's like in our minds, like there's a, a violence tendency. We talked about that in a previous podcast too, where uh, there's it's kind of embedded into our lizard brain for like yeah. murder as part of like a reproductive strategy. And uh, the, the warlike tendency and how with fantasy, you can get it out in a positive way and mm -hmm. you don't have to actually murder each other. So that's a good thing. First person shooter video games. Yeah. Um, I mean, that's all I have as far as the oh, slides, good. but uh, right. I do have a bunch make, of notes. Make us big and again, was, then make us big on the screen. Uh, well, just on. Uh, yeah, I guess um, I kind of covered the. Um, the food and the energy and you can kind of extrapolate um, food with this as well and um, yeah so um, you're gonna have a lot more conflict uh, oh. coming up soon yeah about that same uh, slave uh, type of uh, line the other thing that was very fascinating to me was uh, back then uh, they had a uh, they thought that African slaves, the reason why Africans are so like dominant compared to Native Americans these days, especially, 
is uh, the African slaves, they would get uh, like as far as the value, like the currency extra exchange rate, as far as how, how uh, like the slave trade was, you could have one African and you could get two or three uh, Native Americans for even one African. It sounds like an illogical and weird thing, but mm -hmm. what, we're getting back to what we were talking about mm -hmm. before, the old world versus the new world. The old world had all this agriculture and like industrial level of agriculture. The, the Native Americans barely understood like, like the, you know, large scale agriculture. They would do like localized things. They were less and, skilled labor. Yeah, but also the other thing was Africa had always had these like diseases and stuff, Weird. and these yeah. diseases had always uh, boosted the immune systems and prepared oh, the immune yeah, systems. Yeah, yeah, Native American, uh, they might die of disease after a year. Oh, for you're sure. Introducing them. Yeah, yeah. Uh, when Columbus and them first arrived, uh, they're estimating that ninety-five percent of all the islander populations, like Jamaica and Cuba and all of them. 95% likely died off. Like that's worse than the bu the bubonic plague and yet nobody talks about it. And so they they were well aware of the uh risk of sicknesses and diseases and uh so yeah, the Africans were more skilled with the farming. They were likely to live longer and also they had uh more experience with horses, I believe it was. And so there was a bunch of ways where the old world experience made the African slaves. Native Americans got to be pretty good with horses. Yeah, I, according it to that podcast. depends on the tribe, though. Yeah. Like, Some were all about it. I mean, like the, uh, I don't know a lot about them, but the Apaches, uh, they were like the horse masters. Yeah, this that's was why a, they were able to be competitive. It started uh, in the 1400s AD. Uh Apaches, I think they were later than that, but I'm not positive. I, I mean, I know they were, they were definitely later, but I don't know how much later or if they coexisted yeah. at that time period is what I mean. So, so maybe, uh, so we got all this info. It's uh, it's kind of uh, uh, can give a sneak peek to kind of what's happening in the world. So, so if we can extrapolate a little bit, what does that mean for us? Um, I think it means that um, it's probably surprising to a lot of people that uh that china is the big loser in all this um everyone when i first told you about this you said well china they're gonna they're gonna be doing great right that's the big worry for us yeah no china's in the most trouble out of everyone they're not gonna be able to feed themselves they're gonna have a hard time access to energy countries will burn uh, more coal to make up for the difference to keep the lights on but that doesn't help them with transportation um and uh green tech is uh, only really going to be an option for the people that are able to at least feed themselves yeah. and have access to the capital and the technology to make it happen did this we could make a whole series about this because there's yeah. so many levels to this i haven't even talked about uh how boomers affect capital markets and basically they provide more money and liquidity and that's mm. going away so you're going to have less easy money to finance a lot of projects especially green energy products you need a lot of money up front because uh that's just how the technology works you don't pay for fuel you pay for the installation and then the fuel is free in the case of wind and solar mm. and the sun which is nice but if you don't have the money uh it gets harder to finance that stuff so you can't get it built in the first place and, uh, you know, the U.S. market, uh, everyone is going to flow into us and the dollar because it's a place of safety. But every other country, no one's going to want to buy their debt. You know, that's how they finance stuff. They sell the, go the government sells debt. They sell bonds. But if you think that the government's going to collapse, no yeah. one's going to you won't be able to touch, <laughs> touch those in, bonds with a 10 foot pole. Investing in nothing, basically investing in yeah. your own failure. <laughs> Everyone who invested in Russia, if they had, didn't get their money out, that's all zero. That's all zero at this point. There's no hope of anyone investing in Russia is, uh, is getting any of that out. And a lot of people have been speculating in China and the Chinese stock market. You better get that out of there quick. <laughs> I'm not a financial <laughs> advisor. But uh, <laughs> yeah, that is that not sense. does not seem like a good strategy long term for a country that's going to have a lot of problems. I mean, and China is so manipulated with their currency. You want to talk about printing money? Yeah, I was going to say that. Uh, we've printed money, but China's printed over ten times more money than us <laughs> over time. They Jesus. have. Uh, they don't care about how efficient something is or how much value it adds. <laughs> They're more content with just keeping everyone employed. 
and they will print <laughs> more money just to give people a job, just to have something to do. They don't care if they're actually doing something helpful. If they're doing something, they're getting paid for it, that's good enough. <laughs> so the, stock, the Chinese stock market is like a big, unre- barely regulated casino. Uh, and uh, it's, uh, you're going to be rolling snake eyes there pretty soon, it seems like. Mm-hmm. Um, oh, I was going to say anyone who's, uh, oh, go oh, ahead. Oh, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. Sure. Well, I was just going to do a little side thing about Putin's health. Uh, the new U.S. report came out, uh, intelligence report, saying that Putin actually had uh, cancer treatment surgery, I believe it was, or it was just some kind of a treatment. So he disappeared for a while. That was two months ago, I believe. And uh, now that we're in June, I believe it was two months ago. And, uh, yeah, then I he wish did- the news was that it didn't work and he'll be dead within a month. <laughs> well, yeah. I, I don't even know what to say about it. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I, I, would, I wish, see, the thing is about Putin is that he is level-headed compared to a lot of other uh, rulers from what I've uh, been hearing about, like what Oliver Stone talks about and stuff. So I don't know if we get rid of Putin, maybe worse is go- about to come next. That's the... When there's been a power vacuum, uh, sometimes you do get worse people. Uh, You know, there's uh, some merit to that argument. Uh, You might get, it all depends on who replaces him. uh, If you get someone who's willing to give up this idea of Russian security and uh, have some more integrated approach where maybe the Russian identity kind of fades away a little bit Mm. and they don't have the same national identity, but yeah. it's more peaceful. Unite uh, with the West more, re- restore trade, that kind of angle. Yeah, nice. but it's like, you know, either way, it's it's not looking good for Russia either, just like China. So so some con- uh, companies, let's look at uh, companies, for example, have doubled down on China, like Apple. Mm. Apple, whenever there's been a thing in China, they've always doubled down. And like, they're so heavily invested into China at this point. That I'm a little worried about Apple, and mm. some people think of it as like this bedrock, like behemoth, and you know they do have a lot of money bankrolled, so maybe they'll be able to rebuild somewhere else. But it was gonna be it'll be painful for them to do that. Yeah. Uh, so uh, if you know, I anyone who's not diversified out of China at this point, I think they're gonna be in for some trouble. I think um, we're seeing a lot of industrialization, manufacturing moving to the United States, where um, with uh, new advances in automation, uh, cheap energy, and uh, Mexican labor force in Mexico Mm. as well, you can have some competitive pricing over here and a much more stable and secure supply chain where you're not reliant on their being peace everywhere else in the world. Um, so nice thing is that we could do it over here. China can't, and mm-hmm. a lot of other countries, you know, uh, those East Asian com- countries and Africa. You know, I was going to say, but it might be a good investment. My my friend who uh, works at a financial investing firm, he was telling me about, I believe it was Philip Morris. Is that the one that owns the Marlboro uh, cigarettes and stuff? During these hard times. Sounds right. Yeah, like they own a lot of stuff, but like during the hard times, that's when the alcohol sales go way up and cigarette sales and everything. And so where <laughs> are we now? <laughs> I've seen the dark theory there. I don't uh, know. I mean, cigarettes, uh, I think the younger, the millennials are much less more, uh, less likely to smoke, yeah. I would think. I mean, just anecdotally, I mean, it's, it's true. The, the health concerns it's are more down. present. Ever. We're more about healthy, like... You'd be better off investing in like I don't know, like juice, like juicers, or like you know, it's gonna have our pricey. health drinks. And, that's pricey uh, though, and it's a lot of work and a lot of. <laughs> a lot easier to just light up a cigarette. People just want but, to escape uh, the reality that we're living in, not, not all right. embrace well, it. It doesn't really do it for you. Do it, uh, smoking a cigarette is gonna, uh, you know, escape it. It makes you feel a little bit better, but everyone's so conscious of the health problems yeah. at this point that. It's like it's, I know I'm just gonna pay for it, you know, down the road anyway. It's gone unless down unless you're really lucky. And yeah, over the years, mutations. Yeah, cigarette usage has gone down and down and down more and more over the years. So, you should tell your friend that's uh, that Scott guy, right? Yeah. Well, tell him to look into uh, the big winners are going to be agriculture, uh, U.S. agriculture specifically, because we can make a lot of food here. We have a lot of planes. We get 
rain. Uh, we got cheap energy. We make our own fertilizer. Uh, we and people are going to be looking for more food and we can export more food. Um, mm -hmm. That's the biggest part of our export uh, right now. Actually, if you look at a chart of trade and imports and exports, the US is like last in all the countries on <laughs> percent of GDP that relies on trade. America Crazy. doesn't really care about trade that much. That's why we're, we've been pulling back and we're kind of getting disinterested. Mm. Um, but uh, the one big part is agriculture. So uh, the farmers of the US are going to try to feed the world and make money doing it, but it's still not going to be enough. But uh agriculture i'm very bullish on cool. um sounds good it's gonna be a bit, and um petrochemicals uh hmm. we're talking about those uh products that you make with the yeah. oils natural gas another thing about the shale industry is that natural gas is like a free byproduct of getting out the oil it's a waste product and, and a hmm. lot of those uh, shale operations hmm. it gets vented into the air and burned uh, before they can even start capturing it, hmm. they literally throw it away. So Jeez. we've uh, it's natural gas is so cheap here um, that um, it's a it's a waste product, and uh, now half of our country runs on natural gas. Um, environmentally, it's uh, better to burn than um, uh, coal and oil, but any that leaks is methane. And there's always going to be leaks with pipelines because it's a gas. <gasps> <laughs> yeah. Hard to move a gas around and hard to contain it. So the leaks, methane is like many times worse at trapping heat than carbon dioxide. So it's going to uh, accelerate the greenhouse effect <laughs> of climate crisis, yeah. global warming even more. So many complexities. But, uh, uh, it is. Yeah, it's we're really gonna have to, interesting, though. We're going to have to wrap this up now. We're coming down to our timer again, and it's like almost 2 a.m. My, my time. So, yeah, it was a, yes. a good, uh, nice podcast like normal and a, a different vibe one for sure. We got a more educational uh, visual type of one tonight, so that was cool. And yeah and uh you know i think uh we should pick up on this again i want to get a little more visual aids and uh some yeah. more of this stuff to talk about because cool. um yeah it really just gets to the heart of uh what's really going on in the world and where things are going and um uh, you know for individuals there's not uh you can make some decisions investing decisions and you know, I have some thoughts about how to uh, do better in the future with how the world's changing. But um, I yeah. mean, if you're running a business, um, if you are managing a lot of people or capital, uh, this kind of information can be really valuable. Oh, for you, sure. Uh, how you position yourself in the future. And especially um, if you invest in things that you really believe in, too. Like I've heard a lot of uh, people who aren't. I think it was Kevin Hart, uh, the comedian. Uh, he actually was talking about how he's not a <laughs> he's not an expert, but he just invested in things that he believed in. And I think Joe Rogan may have said that as well. And when you really believe in something because you see the value, that means other people are going to see the value in it, too. And so that's important. So, yeah, unless they're totally insane, that's probably going to work out, you know. <laughs> Uh, a lot of people <laughs> like the same things. Insane investing. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. We got less than a minute here before this right, uh, Zoom cuts us off. Me. But uh, yeah, check out Musings by Marco's uh, channel. Over, and uh, yeah, remember, you shall die. Memento Mori. So make the most of every day. I've been trying my best to do that. Check out uh, Titan uh, NFT, which is cool. They got cool... Uh, sci-fi type of characters and stuff and uh all right much love to you guys you got anything else that you want to say uh no uh yeah i guess that's about it uh yeah uh, we should hopefully talk about this more in the future to come and uh good talking to you and um yeah have a good uh have a good night you too and all you listeners out there have a good one take it easy yep bye everyone